up at what's left of the World Trade Center just shaking their heads in disbelief. We still have a choice today. Non-violent coexistence. A violent core annihilation. We do not act. We shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time. Serve for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. It was in those dark days of 9-11 that interfaith communities united for justice and peace was founded. I called my friend Rabbi Leonard Bierman and Jim Lawson and Rabbi Jacobs, Louis Chase, Ed Bacon, Meher Hatut, Najir Kaja. And I said, we need to meet. We need to see what the religious community's response is to this tragedy. You can remember the day when there was a blackboard and we set about to give this organization a name. And every word meant something and has meant something for the last 11 years. And so the Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace was born. And we have met for 550 Friday mornings at 7.15. Interfaith, we knew that had to be the core of this work. We knew the traditions we had all come from. Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Sikhs and humanists and others. Communities. This was not meant to be just another group of leaders, of clergy, officially blessed into their face. This would be communities that would do the hard work we saw ahead of us. Interfaith communities for something and not just against something. Justice. We knew it had to start with justice and peace. And that was our ultimate goal. Interfaith communities united for justice and peace. Welcome. My name is Adina Lekovich, and on behalf of Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, I welcome you to the annual George Regis Courageous Peacemaker Awards. As you probably know, ICUJP was founded 21 years ago in the wake of the horrific and tragic 9-11 terrorist attacks. For me, as a Muslim woman here in Los Angeles who had graduated college just a few years earlier, it was the most devastating day of my life. It created an uncertainty that I thought would last for generations, not just decades. And I was ready to curl up in a ball, even though I was a professional activist. And here along came incredible interfaith leaders right here in my community, Reverend George Regis, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, Reverend Jim Lawson, and Dr. Maher Hatut to come together and continue their incredible spirit of cooperation and community building through the lens of a multi-faith community. They had been doing it for over a decade here in Los Angeles, so it probably shouldn't have been a surprise that they would come together and create an organization that would lead the way here in Los Angeles for peacemakers, people, Angelinos, who are interested in not just talking about peace, but creating peace. And that's exactly what they did. 21 years later, today, we're thrilled to honor four incredible peace builders who've dedicated their lives to service to humanity. They are Code Pink, Reverend Louis Chase, Dolores Huerta, and Steve Earle. We're incredibly privileged to honor the work that they have been able to accomplish, the way that they inspire all of us, and the way that they have continued the legacy of Reverend Regis and so many others who've been hard at work for 21 years. And now, let's start with our first honoree, Code Pink, Women for Peace.
Code Pink, Women for Peace, and ICUJP all began in the tumultuous years after 9-11. On November 17, 2002, longtime peace activists Medea Benjamin, Jody Evans, Diane Wilson, Starhawk, and about a hundred other women kicked off Code Pink. They set up a four-month, all-day vigil in front of the White House during the cold of winter to protest the war on Iraq that was led by the United States. The vigil inspired people from all walks of life and from all over the country to stand for peace. Many organizations joined in, including Global Exchange, Greenpeace, WAND, Public Citizen, NOW, Women for Women International, and Neighbors for Peace and Justice. For two decades, Code Pink has inspired changemakers, peacemakers all around the world, especially women, to not only stand for peace in the face of war, but to engage in direct action and confront the warmongers of the world, both in public and in the halls of power. Today, it's our privilege to honor the leadership and vision of the founders of Code Pink, Medea Benjamin and Jody Evans. Thank you, Adina, for your lovely words. It is a profound honor to receive this award with my partner in peace, Medea Benjamin, and for all the peacemakers at Code Pink. We have been partners with ICUJP since we began, often in the streets together, and many peace gatherings at All Saints, and standing together each year to call for the release of prisoners at Guantanamo. We are in the family of the larger Peace and Justice Collective. That this is in the name of dear, dear George Regis brought tears to my eyes, missing him and the light he was in our lives. The joy and love that seemed to engulf me when I was in his presence was nourishing, and I still feel that nourishment. He was peace, and our work at Code Pink falls in his lineage. We engage with exuberance and joy for life, being disarming in the face of the arming of the world with our tax dollars. We work locally to build a peace movement that understands the costs of war are born at home in our communities. Yet we bring attention, educate, inspire, and activate about what is happening nationally and globally. We are women run and Reverend Regis valued and fought for the voices and leadership of women. He never entered the fight, what I call the weeds, yet he stood strong and fierce against injustice and wars without compromise. At All Saints, he created a peace economy where what is valued is community and love and care of each other. His joy and service was inspiring his joy in bringing all of us closer to life and what is essential is what our work cultivating peace economies is all about. And I thank all of you at ICUJP who rise early to be together, to learn from each other and others around the world, to plan together, support each other, mentor newcomers, and to build and strengthen our movement. The open-hearted peace is so present in all you do. Thank you for this honor and for being with us as we continue to rise up the costs of war and build a movement that can bring an end to the madness of war and weapons and instead direct those funds to the enrichment of all lives. Onward to peace with love. It is such an honor for me and Jody to receive the George Regis Courageous Peacemaker Award together with these other fabulous awardees. It has been 20 years that we've been working together with ICUJP, trying to stop our government from using militarism to respond to conflicts at home and around the world. I wish we could say that the world was a better place. Certainly it's good that we still don't have thousands of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan killing poor, innocent civilians but we're now engaged in a proxy war with Russia, where the enormous flow of US weapons to Ukraine is prolonging the war, and where Congress just passed a $40 billion Ukraine package, mostly for weapons, without one Democrat, not even Barbara Lee, standing up and saying, we need diplomacy, not more weapons. 
We are also seeing both Democrats and Republicans fueling a conflict with China, as Nancy Pelosi did with her recent trip to Taiwan. And of course, China's a great enemy for the war hawks and the weapons makers because it justifies the enormous and ever-growing Pentagon budget. We do have some bright spots. It looks like the Iran nuclear deal might be worked out despite the pressure from Israel and the hawks in both parties. And this will be a great victory for diplomacy. And we do have progressive governments coming into power throughout Latin America that are demanding respect for their sovereignty and for their resources to be used to better the lives of their citizens, not corporations and billionaires. And here at home, we have millions of dedicated activists, many of whom are from the faith-based community, addressing the issues of poverty, racism, environmental destruction, gun violence, and trying to create communities based on love for people and the planet. This award is an inspiration for me, Jody, and Code Pink to keep up the fight to cut the Pentagon budget and to redirect that money for both our people's needs and the existential threat of climate destruction. As we say at Code Pink, no war, no warming and money for the poor, not for war. And as our dear colleague Dolores Huerta always reminds us, si sí, se puede. Last year's Regus Awards featured original music performances produced by Rachel Warby and her music education nonprofit, Musique. From the sanctuary at All Saints Church in Pasadena, let's revisit and enjoy this magnificent original rendition of Go Down Moses. In the book of Exodus, we learn that God said to Moses, go to the Pharaoh and grab the Israelites away from that Pharaoh. That story got turned into a spiritual because the enslaved African Americans who came to this country brought with them two treasures, the art of singing and a love of storytelling the story and song, Go Down Moses, was one which resonated with them deeply. Reverend Otis Moss once said, never confuse position with power. George Wallace had the position, but Rosa Parks had the power. Lyndon Baines Johnson had the position, but Martin Luther King had the power. The Pharaoh had the position, but it was Moses who had the power. Go down Moses with Musique's wonderful musicians, Ashley Vitolia and Alan Steinberger.
ICUJP's longevity has been anchored over the years by iconic and inspiring voices for peace, including Reverend James Lawson, a mentor for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who has been at the forefront of nonviolent peace activism ever since. Reverend Lawson was interviewed last year from the sanctuary of Holman United Methodist Church in South LA for the Leonard I. Bierman Foundation. The Jewish and black people in the United States have always had a linkage or a sensibility to one another that has meant we have often been in uh, the same struggle for change. I have known this probably all my life since at least high school. In terms of the politics of things, I have known that for a hundred years, in the presidential years of our e elections in the United States, the Jewish community and the black community have voted always on the same side. <laughs> we both know what it means, what it is meant to be in the United States with an invitation to be here that is hostile. <laughs> and if we have not thought that there was a wide enough difference between two presidential candidates, we knew on which side we had the better chance of continue, continuing to make at continuing to dismantle the hostility and to allow the United States to become more of the country it needed to become. What happened January the 6th, we either, our systems of life must teach that group of people that democracy requires character, a serious study and wrestling with issues, and language of conversation that allows us to solve issues and live together. That the gun and the bomb and the tear gas will not allow us to develop in the 21st century. The USA people need to recognize that the underside of love is justice and building a community where human freedom can be practiced <laughs> and can be enjoyed. It is my great honor to introduce Reverend James Lawson, presenting our next George Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award to lifelong peace activist and our beloved Reverend Lewis Chase. Thank you, Adina. I speak as one of the founders of ICUJP. I, I will never forget waking up that morning. Dorothy had on television in the channel where we could see the planes moving into the building. And I watched it more than once. I then called George Regas said, we have to meet, and I'll come to your place, your office, at noontime. And we called one or two other people. We began meeting every Friday morning, 7 a.m., and out of those meetings came what continues to be one of the fine witnesses in a world led by men who dominate for profits and war and the military and war economies and who insist that we therefore do not have the monies 
or the capacities to feed the hungry and heal the sick and raise the dead. And that witness continues in this gift of awarding the George Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award annually. And our good friend and colleague and one of our wonderful leaders Lewis Chase is the recipient for this year of 2022. So uh, on behalf of all of us and all the people around our earth who make the witness for truth in these times of extraordinary deceit and lie, but also in the name of the Interfaith Community for Justice and Peace. We make the Regus Courageous Peacemaker Award to the 2022 recipient, the Reverend Lewis Chase. Thank you, uh, Jim, for those words of introduction. I have treasured your mentorship, friendship, and collaboration in the United Methodist Church ecumenical groups, and other settings securing human rights around the world. I am indeed honored to be one of the recipients of the 2022 George F. Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award. I celebrate the leg legacy of George Regas through the ongoing work of interfaith communities united for justice and peace. The ICU JP Award represents a clear vision of truth, deeply rooted in values that honor and promote a culture of peace, justice, and human dignity. All persons are made in the image of God and gifted to pursue their full potential. Through discernment, research, sacred protests and advocacy, I see you, JP, demonstrates the vastness and capacity of love that enables the community to work tirelessly, nonviolently, and to give extravagantly to the soul of the nation and the soul of each other. Within our ICUJP camp, we differ, we laugh, we critique, we celebrate, we argue, and we grow each other all within the framework of love, respect, and regard. And this, I propose, is the model ICUJP presents to the world as a way forward to realizing the beloved community. George's invitation to join a movement at a frightening season of terror continue to be relevant. We ask that all who are watching or all who are engaging the recipients in one fashion or other, that you commit yourself to those words of 
the ICUJP movement that religious communities must stop blessing war and violence. Mm. These words offer life and hope to the world. We must stop the war. We must stop the war now. Um, I thank you, uh, Jim, for uh, being here. Um, it is, of course, um, a long-standing uh, relationship for over uh, four decades uh, here mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in the Holman uh, United Methodist Church uh, community. Uh, it also gives me a great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce uh, long-time collaborators of ICUJP, Agape. Show the world and all its people All the wonders love can bring Give us strength and understanding Give us so one song to sing Let the music Play. play it loud and make it clear It's time to stand up mm. To a new world that is now so near All the walls are falling down no more children of the war. Ooh, we're searching our hearts. All the suffering will be no more. And let there be joy in the world. Let there be.
Peace and richest blessings. I am Michael B. Beckwith, founder of the Agape International Spiritual Center. Powerful shout out to the Interfaith Council for putting on this wonderful George Regis Awards presentation. And what a powerful group of honorees. Dolores Welta, Code Pink, the Reverend Lewis Chance, and of course, the Reverend Jim Lawson. All these beings stand in the vibrational legacy of Brother George, who worked with the farm workers, as we all know, was on the right side of history in terms of challenging our governments going into Vietnam, the Iraq War. All of these individuals stand in that vibration of spiritual activism. I'm very, very grateful that our global choir gets to be a part of this. Under the direction of Marianne Lewis, we have a global choir that's the epitome of inclusivity. Individuals from all, from all around the globe singing together for the upliftment of the soul that we may bring heaven to earth. Have a beautiful, beautiful evening. ICUJP has prided itself over the years to honor some of the greatest, most inspiring peacemakers and social justice organizers of our time. And this year is no exception. Our next awardee is the embodiment of our values, our vision, and our mission. It is my distinct honor to introduce United Farm Workers co-founder alongside Cesar Chavez and lifelong leader of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, Dolores Huerta. I had a very rich, rich childhood. I was very, very blessed and fortunate because my mother was a, a person that really believed in culture. Early on, I was a Girl Scout from the time I was eight to the time I was 18 years old, very active in Girl Scouts. As a teenager, I belonged to the church choir. I was uh, involved in dancing, uh, both folklorico, flamenco, uh, tap and ballet. I took music lessons, both violin and piano. The only negative thing about my, my teenage years, and especially in high school, was the racism that we had to endure. Uh, because we were Mexican-Americans and because our our, our group that we all hung out with, there was all the, the Asians, the Filipinos, the black kids, and the police were always giving us a hard time. So we faced that on the streets with the police, and then in, in our high school, uh, the racism against the, uh, not only the kids of color, but also the poor white kids was very severe. I was working here in Los Angeles uh, with the community service organization. Uh, Cesar was the director, and I was the executive secretary. And it was actually here in East Los Angeles when we decided to start the Farm Workers Union. It was at Caesar's house there, where he was living there on Folsom Street. And he called me over to his house one morning, and he said, you know, the farm workers will never have a union unless you and I do it. And uh, I thought he was joking. He said, no, I'm serious. Uh, I was lucky enough to be the political director for the organization, uh, and we had all of these chapters throughout the state. Uh, we got uh, driver's licenses in Spanish and other ethnic languages, and we got the ballots in the Spanish language, and uh, the disability insurance for farm workers, and then we passed uh, a, a law that you could register a voters door to door, and so we were able to pass a, a very important law uh, to take away the requirement that you had to be a U.S. citizen to get public assistance. One of the things that we are working on is number one, bringing to the attention of the American public what the contributions of immigrants are because they don't realize how much people do. The work that they do, picking our food, we remind people the food that you ate today, some immigrant picked that food, probably an undocumented person. We have to legalize the people that are already here because they have earned it with their work and with their tax dollars that they have paid and their contributions that they have made to our economy. Thank you, Adina, and this great organization, Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, for all of the work that you have been doing over all of these years. We have made a lot of progress, but we know we still have a long way to go. But that means that we will keep on working as hard as we can to reach that goal, and we will see it. Yes, justice and peace in the United States and all over the world. It can happen. Yes, we can. Si se puede. 
Our special guest today has carried the mission forward that Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez first organized beginning 50 years ago in the streets and the fields of California. 2014 Poet Laureate of Los Angeles, Luis Rodriguez, born and raised in East Los Angeles, found his muse inspired by the movements of the 1960s and 1970s. He remains today a defining figure of contemporary Chicano literature. Well, to get to understanding that moment of when I had a voice, you have to understand how silent I was, how voiceless I was. Most of all my arrests were for violent acts. I was on heroin, I stole, I burglarized. They hardly ever got me for any of that. What they got me was because I would rage. And I was in jail for a lot of violent acts, including attempted murder when I was 17. I was on murder row when I was 16. At the end, uh, at 18, I was arrested for um, assaulting police officers. I say it in quotes because there's a whole story behind that. In many ways, my fist, my violence was my voice. That's how I spoke. You know, I didn't have to say anything. I gave people dirty looks, and if they dared to take me on, I took them on. I learned again through the Chicano movement that there's other ways to go, to think, to raise issues, to be strategic, to have language. And one of the good things that helped me is that I'm one of the, few, I'm probably the only homeboy that loved to read. I don't know anybody that loved to read. I loved to read because, again, my original sense of life was reading and being in my imagination. So the reading was my saving grace. When I was homeless in the streets of downtown LA, that central library was my refuge. I spent hours there reading books. I think it might have been the black um, power books that came out in the 60s. I began to see that I could be a center of a story because Malcolm X's book came out and James Baldwin was writing and uh, Aldous Cleaver and George Jackson, all these revolutionary uh, people coming out of the Black Panthers, all the movement people. I began to imagine it's a weird thing that maybe I could do a book, you know, because I was living such an intense life. If you read Perry Thomas's story and the ups and downs and the heroin and the crimes and everything he's been through and, and I'm thinking, hey man, that's my story, you know? He's in Spanish Harlem and I'm in East LA, but it's my story. And so I think that gave me the seed. Why don't you do a story? And I actually first began writing in Juvenile Hall and then I did it when I was in the Murder's Row at 16. Um, when people were playing cards or maybe doing art or just talking, I started writing my first poems. That is the seed that grew into all my books, 16 books and even having a bookstore and even having a publishing house, the Atucha Press. I knew that I could be the center of the story. I didn't have to be just a spectator to others. The thing has to do with the mutated male that I had to overcome. That, you know, machista, you know, power over others, dominance, that kind of male that was very big in the neighborhood. The problem is we don't know the big story. You know, we have a big longing that our lives were traumatized. I need my story told. I don't, nobody knows my gifts. Well, okay, that's important. But the big longing, the big hunger is that all our people, their stories are told. I'm honored to be part of this really important gathering and to be linked to the principles and goals of the Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace. Um, I spent a life um, trying to live up to these goals myself. I started off, as people might know, as a very troubled young man. I was in gangs since age 11. I was on drugs, including heroin, since age 12. Uh, I was homeless for three years. I was in and out of jails and juvenile halls. Um, but I was able to get out of this because of the amazing amount of activists, revolutionaries, thinkers, and organizers at the time, the late 60s and 70s. And um, some of them found me and gave me the vision of a new world. and the ways that I could impact that world. And I left that whole life around age 1920, pretty much gave it all up. Um, the year that my oldest son was born, Ramiro, I held him in my arms. And then two years later, my daughter Andrea came out, um, was born. And I promised them that I would never return to drugs, gangs, crime, and jails. And I have not for any criminal offenses. I kept that promise for, well, over 50 years. But I never wanted to give up on the people that were caught up in that world. A lot of my homies, a lot of friends. Um, 
And also years later, uh, my own son got caught up in that world. And he, uh, when I moved to Chicago, he ended up coming with me a few years after that and got in a lot of trouble. And when he was 15, he joined a gang. And at 17, he started his first prison term. And uh, he did a total of uh, 15 years in the Illinois prison system and um, was released in 2010. Uh, but he's doing well right now. He's been out for 12 years. He's been working with me. He's now living in Los Angeles. We moved back to LA in the year 2000. And uh, we started, me and my wife, a culture space called Tia Chucha Center Cultural and Bookstore. And my son has helped and volunteered with that. And we also started a program called Trauma to Transformation, in which we take artists, theater people, and uh, writers, poets, into prisons, uh, parole housing, juvenile facilities to teach. Um, I've been doing this work, teaching uh, creative writing and or doing poetry events and or lectures and or healing circles in prisons, jails and juvenile lockups for over 40 years. I uh, love this work, it's, it's very inspiring, giving back but also getting the work from these men and women and youth that I work with. And we've done a number of anthologies of their work. Uh, the last one that we did was called Make a Poem Cry which is uh, published by my press, the Atucha Press, which has been around for over 33 years. We've got over 100 books. So I'm gonna share a poem that I wrote uh, based on a line by one of the participants in my class, one of my classes there at Lancaster State Prison. His name is Jimmy McMillan, and the poem, um, the line goes like this. I can't see him coming from my eye, so I had to make this poem cry. The poem's called Make a Poem Cry. You can chain the body, the face, the eyes. The way hands move coarsely over cement or deftly on tattooed skin with needle. You can cage the withered membrane, the withered dream, the way razor wire, shouts, yells, and batons can wither spirit. But how can you imprison a poem? How can a melody be locked up, locked down? Yes, even caged birds sing. Even grass sprouts through asphalt. Even a flower blooms in a desert. And the gardens of trauma we call the incarcerated can also spring with the vitality of a deep thought and emotion buried beneath the facades, deep as rage, deep as grief, the grief beneath all rages. The blood of shuts poems, songs, emotions, thoughts, dances, all what flow and all art, stages, films, books, the keys to liberation are in the heart, in the mind, behind the cranial sky. The imagination is boundless, the inexhaustible in an, any imprisoned system. And remember, we are all in some kind of prison. If only the contrived freedoms society professes can flow from such water. Thank you all very much. ICUJP, since its inception, has always embraced the music of inspired nonviolent resistance. Pro democracy music from the likes of Woody Guthrie, Lucinda Williams, Jackson Brown, Joan Baez, and so many others who defined the tone for transformational social movements. Today's torchbearer of that spirit is singer songwriter and multiple Grammy Award winner Steve Earle. He's a voice who has prevailed at peace rallies all around the nation and inspired multiple generations. And it's for this reason that ICUJP is recognizing his life's work with the George Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award. Thanks, Adina. Um, it's one of the, uh, the greatest honors of my, my um, career and my life as an activist to receive the 2022 George F. Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award. Um, I'm just a singer and a songwriter, but I, you know, I did learn a long time ago that you can sing things that you can't say, and uh, people will listen. And I, I wrote this song, and then I recorded it, and I sing it, and Joan Baez recorded it, and she sings it, and Jackson Brown sings it. And what we have in common is. I'm gonna just 
keep on singing it until uh, it comes true or I die, whichever one happens first. As the chair of ICUJP, I just want to thank you all for being here today. I'm filled with gratitude. I'm thankful to everyone who helped prepare this event. We had an extraordinary organizing committee. I want to especially thank Morgan Tucker and Rick Banales. Uh, we're very grateful to Robert Corsini. He was the producer of this event, the videographer, uh, the creative force behind it. Uh, we're immensely grateful to you, Robert. We want to thank Amara Anayue and Steffi Taylor for their work in helping uh, this event succeed. Uh, how great was the Agape Choir? That was just an extraordinary musical moment and we're 
uh, very appreciative to them and to Michael Beckwith at uh, Agape. Uh, we appreciate the spoken word of uh, Louis Rodriguez and of course Adina Lekovic, our host today. She does an extraordinary job in her work and she's a good friend of ICUJP's. And finally, in my thanks goes to Reverend James Lawson, a founder of ICUJP, a pillar of our community when it comes to the struggle for peace and justice. I'd like to congratulate uh, the honorees tonight. Uh, Reverend Lewis Chase has been with ICUJP from its very founding. Uh, the extraordinary work of Medina Benjamin and Jody Evans in founding and pursuing Code Pink, which has been such a force uh, in this country and around the world. Uh, the extraordinary Dolores Huerta, her work for labor, for people, for the struggle for justice and equality in this country is immense. And the wonderful work of Steve Earle and his extraordinary music and his powerful words in favor of social justice. These are extraordinary individuals who are advancing the cause of justice and peace every single day. All of this was made possible because of the work and the passion of Reverend George Regas. He founded ICUJP in the wake of 9-11 in those dark days. George knew that by gathering Christians and Jews and Muslims and Sikhs and Buddhists and humanists, he could help chart a path forward out of the darkness of those times and the war and violence he anticipated uh, and to bring us to a better place. It's been for over a thousand Friday forums that uh, ICUJP has been spreading its work. Uh, we've had the annual closed Guantanamo rallies to end the oppression and the barbarous nature of Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we've engaged in civil disobedience uh, across this region. We've held conferences and seminars and webinars during COVID, and we've had lobby visits and issued statements to advance our mission that religious communities must stop blessing war and violence. I deeply miss George Regas. Uh, he was a mentor, a friend, and an inspiration to me and hundreds and thousands of others. I'll never forget when George gave a sermon. He said that the sin at the heart of the Iraqi war is the belief that an American life is of more value than an Iraqi life, that an American child is more precious than an Iraqi baby. I miss you, George, but please know that your work goes on. If tonight you've been moved and inspired by anything you've seen and heard today, please consider supporting ICUJP financially with our ongoing work in the struggle for justice and peace. Please go to icujp.org and be as generous as you can. We are a small volunteer organization with only two part-time employees. Our goal is to expand and continue our work. To keep doing our work, we appreciate your support very much. Thanks again for joining us today. The struggle for justice and peace is daunting. The need is great, but together, standing in solidarity, we must not relent. The forces of racism and repression in this country and around the world must be stopped. Together, we can help create the world George Regas envisioned. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, Steve. What a special event this has been. I'm so inspired by our honorees and I'm excited to take what we've learned tonight and put it into our work moving forward. Thank you for joining us. May peace be with you always. Have a great day. Les Rice wrote this song in 1950. It's coming back again. I've rambled around this country from shore to shining shore. And 
it really makes me wonder the things I heard and saw. I saw the weary farmer plowing sod and low, but I heard the auction hammer knocking down his home. But the banks are made of marble with a guard at every door. And the vaults are stuffed with silver that the farmer sweated for. And I saw the weary miner scrubbing coal dust from his back. But I heard his children crying, got no coal to heat the shack. But the banks, but the banks are made of marble with a guard at every door. And the vaults, and the vaults are stuffed with silver that the miner sweated for. And I saw the weary seaman standing idly by the shore. And I heard the bosses saying, got no work for you no more. But the banks, but the banks are made of marble with a guard at every door. And the vaults and the vaults are stuffed with silver that the seamen sweated for. Yes, I've seen good people working throughout this mighty land, and I pray we get together and together make a stand. Then we'll own, then we'll own those banks of marble with no guard at any door, and we'll share, and we'll share those vaults of silver that we all Share those vaults of silver that we all have.